statistics, but stories and storytellers. And as we all are waiting to see if our state or our country or our community goes back to school, uh, teachers who are in the trenches are waiting, waiting to love on those kids who've been anxious and scared during this pandemic. And so tonight is really a celebration of those who, who humbly serve, especially the most vulnerable among us. And following that amazing montage of teachers and stories and storytellers, you're gonna meet about a dozen original freedom writers. Freedom writers who've spent the entire duration of this pandemic paying it forward, helping kids. Some of those kids are the most vulnerable among us who may not have Wi-Fi, who may not have a computer, who live in homes that have existential crises about do I pay the rent? Do I buy food? Do I do my homework? And so what the Freedom Riders have understood is how can we be a voice to the voiceless and elevate and lift and listen and learn, but ultimately love? Um, that's what our Freedom Rider family does is we lead with love. So it's gonna be amazing tonight as those Freedom Riders tell their stories, stories not only of the past from room 203 and their diaries, but how they are activists and authors and leading the way as agents for change now. So without further ado, what I wanna do is encourage you to sit back, grab some popcorn. It's gonna be a, a two hour journey. The Freedom Rider film is two hours and three minutes. We're gonna be shy of that two hours and three minutes, but we hope you listen to all these wonderful stories and then are inspired yourself to read, to watch yet again, or have a courageous conversation with whomever you're watching this with, your sweetie pie, your, your friend, a student, um, someone you've never had a conversation with before. That's what tonight is about is, to be daring, to be bold, and to leave this very safe space, seeing things a little different. So what I'd love to do is ask you to stay around for the next two hours if you have it on your heart to help, to help the Freedom Riders to continue doing the good that they're doing. You can help us. You could donate. You could help us get computers in the hands of kids who desperately need them. You could download our curriculum and use our curriculum wherever you may teach, whether it's a club, whether it is a, a school, whether it's in your home. But we want you to feel a part of this. So throughout the night, I'm gonna be asking you to figure out ways that you can stay involved, to be involved and to pay it forward. So without further ado, what I wanna do is when the pandemic hit, we found out on Netflix that the movie Freedom Writers was trending. And then it was trending on Amazon Prime. And then we found that there was a lot of bootleg copies around the world. <laughs> found Freedom Writers. And they found it as a way to seek solace. They found it to say, I look like them. I talk like them. And I come from where they come from. So every single day, people found the story. And they found themselves. And then the protest happened. And then came the memes. Then came the, the discussions about what happened back in Los Angeles in 1992 was happening around our country, around our, our globe. And suddenly people wanted to, just as John Lewis, stand up, speak up, and speak out. Uh, our namesake, Freedom Writers, comes from that noble man who walked across that bridge in Selma, John Lewis. And when John Lewis met the Freedom Riders, he encouraged them to get into trouble, to good trouble. So that's what we're gonna do tonight. We're gonna get into some good trouble um, because who's joining me, they too are activists. They too are husbands and wives and brothers and sisters. But more than anything, I think the resounding storyline is that Freedom Riders wasn't just a moment in time. It wasn't just a movie. It was a way for them to be a bit bigger, certainly bolder, and it made all of us better. So without further ado, I wanna introduce my crazy cast of characters. I wish you all could leap through the screen and, and give me a virtual hug. Um, but let me start with the darling April Hernandez Castillo. You might recognize April as Ava 
you might have seen the memes that say, I hate white people. And that was directed at me. Yes, it was. <laughs> you might remember um, how feisty and determined she was. And she is more determined and dogmatic in real life. She is an actress. She is an author. And she has a book that's going to be coming out um, this fall that I am blessed to write her forward for. So everyone Yay. has a book time. We're all going to read April's new book. Um, I also want to say hello to Deonce. Um, Deonce, you might remember, was the character Jamal. And if it wasn't for Jamal, AKA Sherrod, right. none of us would be here today. There was that note, there was that character, caricature, and there was that hatred. And so we went on this odyssey of looking at man's inhumanity. And Jamal did so beautifully. This tough kid wasn't so tough after all and he is tender and he is transparent and i'm just so proud that he is here with a smile from ear to ear so hi Beyonce. Hey. Um, <laughs> also beaming on my screen is giovanni and giovanni i was told yesterday by a voracious fan of yours giovanni that you were in the first and the best bring it on <laughs> I know there's been many, but you were in the first and the best, and it was told to me in all caps, bold, and exclamation points. So you're going to have a lot of fans out there that are going to recognize your face from all of those Nickelodeon shows and Disney and Bring It On, but you played the resolute Victoria, and you took racism on head on. And so when folks have seen that Freedom Rider film, your scene is the one that sticks, um, that allows kids to realize I can confront somebody who has power and authority if things aren't right and things aren't normal. So welcome, Giovanna. <laughs> um, right in the center of my screen is somebody who's not just an actor, but a dear friend. And I have followed him ever since I met him in the trailers when they had cast all the students the Darlene Hunter Parish. Um, I have followed his career in television, on movies, on Broadway. I sat in the front row center when he was the star of Spring Awakening. I think I squealed a little too loud when I was in the, that front row. Um, he <laughs> is about to play Jem in my favorite book of all time, To Kill a Mockingbird on Broadway. And he's stuck on the East Coast because Got Broadway was shut down. He is part of this pandemic. But as soon as Broadway reopens, I want to be there on opening night to hoot and holler for, um, for Hunter bringing his character to life. So hello, Hunter. And last but never least is my darling friend, Jackie. And I love that she said when she joined us, this is her quarantine hair, it's fantastic. Um, <laughs> Jackie is the only person on Pacific Daylight Time. Her and I are in uh, California. Deonce and Giovanni are coming from Atlanta and April is in New York and Hunter is in New Jersey. But Jackie and I are on the same time zone, we're in the same city and we are lamenting about the spike and splurge of our coronavirus here in California. Um, so you, for a lot of people, um, you have one of the best moments of the film. Um, that moment, that tender moment where you walk into the classroom and Ava, AKA April, is tough and she's mad and she's thinking, how am I gonna go home? And you pull out your makeup and you say, I think I have your shade. Every time I have watched that movie with a crowd of people, there is literally Jackie, like an audible gasp. It's so sweet. It's so understated, um, but it's so perfect. And so you are part of the fabric of our family and I'm so thrilled. And I would love for you to be able to hear that audible gasp um, because it truly is what, what moves us to be kind, um, to be accepting and to be inclusive. So this is our family. For the next half hour, um, I'm gonna ask them questions. Uh, I, I'm very selfish because I got them all to myself before we went live. <laughs> and to hear them talk about marriages and ba babies and jobs. Um, I was able to go to both April and Hunter's wedding. Oh, it was amazing. Jackie, when you get married, you better invite me. I am now ordained so I can actually even officiate, what? should you so choose. <laughs> 
That is so cool. Wow. <laughs> um, and I know that one of my uh, my dear friends, the first person that I, I married was my dear friend, Johnny, and his fabulous hundred husband, Mike. And I was able to marry them in the backyard of the Freedom Mars Foundation. It was gorgeous and glorious. So I know that Johnny's watching and his husband is as well. So when you're ready, Jackie, I can marry anybody, anywhere, anytime. So, when, <laughs> so uh, what I want to do before there was babies and marriages and pandemics, there was this script and all of you were found perfectly cast and somehow, some way you had to bring this story to life. So I want to start with you, April. You're given this amazing opportunity to play the character Maria, AKA Ava in the film. And tell me what it was like for this feisty Puerto Rican from the Bronx to play a feisty Latina from Mexico right here in Southern California. What was, what was your process when suddenly you had to bring this character to life? Uh, it's interesting because the first thing that, that came to my mind was I'm not Mexican, right? I'm Puerto Rican. Um, I'm, I'm more of a Caribbean type of Latina. So will I even be able to pull this off? Do I focus on having an accent? Like all of these things that at one point I said, okay, this is, I'm not going to focus on that. I'm going to focus on telling the story. So once I got past that, I remember I auditioned in New York City and I didn't hear anything. You know, that moment when you're just like, well, I guess I didn't get it, right? I ended up, <laughs> you just assume always like, well, whatever, it's their loss, not mine. And so I eventually, I just so happened to also, I was offered, this is when ER was on, and this is before Grey's Anatomy, that ER was like the show. So I moved to LA with no car, no license, working on ER, and I had a second audition for Freedom Riders. And I remember walking in uh, and the room was like this big. <laughs> and it was Richard and I believe it was Sharon and, um, and, and the casting director. And I had to do the monologue of I hate white people. And I went in, I was like, okay, this is it. This is where you drop the mic. This is where you don't think about it. You know, you just go for it. And I remember Richard, the director, was just there, like, <laughs> oh. and I was like, okay, I have to go. And he was like, can you come back? And like, no one knew I didn't have a car. I didn't, it was, it was just pure New York hustle. I was like, you know, I can't, I get, oh my goodness. And in my head, I'm thinking like, I missed it. And so when I received the phone call that I booked the role, it was one of those moments I didn't really understand the capacity. I didn't understand the the like the amazing story behind the Freedom Riders. I just knew that I booked a t a, a movie role and I was going to be working with Hillary Swank. And once I began to understand my character, I was like, oh wow, this is this is something I've never experienced because being from New York City, I never really experienced racism. You know, I never experienced hating someone just for their color because we're a melting pot so that was like the biggest challenge i think about you hunter because you you've gone on to like i said do television and movies and broadway but you were up for a part in high school musical and I, when i think of how iconic that film is as well as freedom arts how, how does one make a decision when you're offered several different opportunities, um, how did you choose that being in Freedom Writers was the right path for you? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I mean, to be fair to the the acting experience, you know, we are we are we are lucky to get to do what we love if we get to do it, you know, um, and it, we don't get to do it as much as we want to do it, um, and. So, yeah, um, there are opportunities that come your way that you like more than others or want to do more than others. But I think um, there's two things that I think uh, for me, particularly with Freedom Writers and a couple other projects that have meant a lot to me, similar subject matter. Um, the first 
uh, part of that formula is having a good team, having people around you who know what you value and what you care about and what you're interested in, things that you want to be a part of. Um, but if I'm honest, like I, I, I wasn't as tuned in as they were at the time, you know, I think I was 19 or 18 when we made the film. So I had a lot to learn. Um, I look back now and I realize just, just how much I had to learn. Um, I learned some things on set to learn, you know, a lot um, throughout, but, uh, but I would say, I'd say that's probably the key part, right? Is, uh, all of us are really particular about who we have representing us that they carry, carry us into the projects that we want to be a part of. Um, and that, you know, we, again, we don't get very many opportunities all the time. So, so we want to, we want the ones that we get to do to be something we care about. And I just, that would be the second part is, is understanding that the game is fun. We get to do something that's fun, but when you get to do it and have impact and have meaning on a, on a um, cross-cultural level and, and uh, it's 07, the, the show came, the film came out, right? So we were filming probably 06. That's like, almost 15 years now um, to be able to still be talking about it and for it to be more relevant now than ever is a, a true privilege. And um, uh, so I, I just feel fortunate and uh, I don't, I'm not taking any credit for the strategy of, you know, getting to do a film like this. I think, um, I think we're all lucky and feel very fortunate to be a part of the story mm. of your story. Oh, our, our story. It's, it's definitely a we. Um, Beyonce, what I, I love about your character, um, my student Sherrod, is that it parallels what's happening in America now, and, you know, systematic racism. And mm -hmm. what, what Sherrod had to fight his whole life was feeling like an other. And that dehumanizing moment with that note, um, later in this live stream, you're actually going to meet the person who drew that note, who is oh, going to God. apologize for being the bully. You're on the <laughs> you raised his hand and said, what is the Holocaust? Um, but I think for you, Beyonce, that was such a powerful moment then, but that's one of the most powerful moments to this day. So take us back to what it was like knowing in the script that this was a game changer, that this wasn't just a, a movie about kids and a teacher, but it dealt with man's inhumanity. It dealt with bullying and it dealt with systematic racism. Mm -hmm. uh, man, yeah, I definitely remember um, reading, reading that and trying to figure out how, um, with trying to keep everything grounded, keeping it real, the, the mindset that I put myself in in that moment, like I, cause I wanted to make sure I was just living in the moment. I didn't plan on anything. I didn't, I didn't want to make a strategic plan to to cry or to do whatever. My mind was just like, if I was in that position and I had been bolstering all this time, creating, you know, this um, this aura about me to try to keep the eyes off of me, um, how would I feel if I got somebody just totally just called me out for one of the things that is like, um, I guess like a weakness, like they called out my weakness and they called it out at a moment that I was not expecting. Um, the, that moment was just, it was a real moment. Like the, the reaction to it, I felt like, uh, was organic. I didn't plan on it. It was tough because we shot that scene for about two and a half days, I think, getting mm -hmm. all the coverage. So the tough part for me and that was really continuing to cry because I did it the first take and I was like yeah you gotta keep doing that I was like oh thanks uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but that moment was important um because it just showed a, a vulnerability that we all uh have even though sometimes we don't even realize it um and I feel like some of the parallels that were in my life that I can kind of attach myself to was being uh I don't like to use the word victim of it, but I guess people, you know, but I have been in a situation with police brutality and at the age of 17. So two years prior to this film, uh, as a senior in high school, I was working on a play in LA and was coming, leaving a rehearsal in Hollywood and just trying to drive home. But I got pulled over and got treated as if I 
killed somebody, if I robbed somebody uh, uh, with multiple squad cars, six, seven different squad cars, all guns pointed at me. Uh, so I kind of, you know, touched on that moment a little bit um, in this summer process and trying to think of a very vulnerable state uh, of not feeling in control, uh, where I felt like uh, Jamal always tried to control the situation. Uh, so that's what that that moment was for me is just thinking of just staying in the real moment and letting the energy of everybody's performance just drive uh, the scene and the reaction was was that and um, uh, but that was the mindset going into it though just keeping it grounded being real and true to the moment just allowing things to flow but yeah there that that was probably my uh, thought process in that. Wow, Jackie. So we have uh, in the in the film, everyone is is named a different name to protect their freedom rights. They wrote their stories when they were minors, um, and they use numbers instead of names. So you are this beautiful composite of Bunny and Kanya, um, two beautiful freedom writers. Kanya is going to be joining us this evening as well. Both Bunny and Kanya are daughters of genocide survivors from Cambodia. And in, in recent days with the pandemic, there's been a lot of projecting and fear about what happened with their families at home and the fear of what's happening in America now. Um, both Bunny and Kanya noticed their mothers want to hoard you know, they're terrified. They, they lost friends and family due to Pol Pot. And so your character um, is instrumental because as, as the viewers will remember, you, you witnessed a murder and you and Ava are at crosshairs. So when I mentioned earlier that moment when you, you do do that, that peace offering of I've got your shade, it, it was, um, such a beautiful bridge. You know, we, we often build walls, but you built a bridge instead. So can you talk about what that was like to play a fusion of, of two of my students who had witnessed things that no teenager should witness, experienced things that no teenager should experience, and yet still had the, the grace and the gratitude to evolve and change? Yeah, I mean, wow, I mean, it, in the moment at the time of filming, um, you know, luckily I didn't really think too much, like at the time as I was 17 when we were filming and all I kind of knew as I was, as I was uh, playing this character was I knew that as long as I stuck to my instincts and just kept my ear and my heart open to what this character is experiencing just the heart of it, I kind of felt, okay, let's not overcome, I'm not gonna, because if I think about like the, the, what it really all is about, it's gonna just be like, oh my God, this is like, this is crazy. But I just kind of, as someone that grew up in LA, working class, I'm Filipino and Chinese. Um, I, I just felt such a rapport with the character and with this struggle of being, you know, basically, Asian girl that's not the not the model minority Asian girl but like the one that's riding along in the street and being you know doing your thing trying to survive and I think just kind of tapping into that almost intergenerational wisdom and like of like traumas that are you know passed down and just kind of like you just kind of understand that there's a deep pain here and as long as I just kind of stay true to that even though you know I'm not Cambodian and I haven't, I'm not related to someone that has suffered genocide, but just keeping that open heart and that understanding from my own life of, you know, I kind of felt. I mean, when I was on set, when when I was auditioning for for Cindy to be Cindy, I literally just rolled up all punked out in my as me, you know, <laughs> and the cast directors and and Richard were they were just like, this is this is what this is the essence of this character, you know? So I just kind of stuck to my guns with just the simplicity of like the roughness and need for survival, that just kind of knowledge, that just kind of inherent, like 
this is just what it is. And then the softness of reaching out to Ava, I mean, that, you know, for me, like personally, that scene, it really was just how it was for me in my high school, like girls fight. And then you're just like, then you're in the bathroom and then you're just kind of like, all right, like, is this going to go down again? I don't know. I don't really want to do this. And then it's just like, I'm you, you're me. Like, where is the scene? Like, I fucking, excuse my French. Um, I cry, you cry, like, you know, and it just felt like, it felt familiar to reach out as Cindy to Ava in that moment, you know, it, it just felt like a sister, you know, you're in war together. And it, it felt like a moment in the trenches where you're just like, all right, like we're in this together, so. I love that. Giovanni, what your scene represents is my student, Tanya. And true to form, Tanya is bright. She's going to graduate school. And what you actually read on the page of your script is Tanya's story verbatim in the book. I mean, Richard Lagravenis did such a brilliant job of taking words directly that were written by freedom writers and then giving them to you to bring to life. So I love that what you said is exactly what Tanya wrote. But that's really difficult when you are a young woman um, being asked to be the Gallup poll or to, to feel like you are speaking for an entire race. And it really stems to people with power having unconscious bias or just being overtly racist because your character really took racism head on in an institution. So can you talk about what that was like to play just this strong character who left like an honors program to be a part of my program. But in, in doing that, it was more about standing up to power and saying, this is wrong, this is unjust, and this isn't fair. Um, I felt like we were kindred spirits, this character. Um, growing up as the token, which is a term for the only black person. Hi, honey, Hi, it's my husband. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Growing up as the token on just about anywhere, whether it was on TV, I usually was the token black girl on the show or the token black girl in the classroom. I understood exactly her pain and how it feels sometimes where people say backhanded compliments where they don't really understand that that's a backhanded compliment. For example, oh, you're one of the good ones or you're really smart for a black girl. Like that's, that's not a compliment. That's a microaggression that's very offensive to kind of categorize us in all of that same thing. So I was so ready for, to see that on television, a different perspective of, you know, the token. And it was very refreshing and honest and raw to finally be heard. The, the best explanation I could give you for her. Like, I, it just sucks sometimes being the token because you have to work twice as hard just to get half the decency. And that's unfortunately a black saying. Like, okay, once you do accomplish some kind of greatness or status you're still the other you're still oh you're the exception to the black rule which isn't right or fair mm. you know i i i need you to meet tanya because when we the freedom writers watch the film you captured her perfectly her her sass her brilliance and you you nailed it I want to ask you something wonderful soon to be second book author. Um, April's already written uh, her first book, Your Voice, Your Choice. She's writing a second book, Embracing Me. But I, I know that she often gives credit to the freedom writers for, for writing first to giving you this opportunity to say, I've got something to say. I've got something to write. So can you talk about why you've chosen to write a second memoir? Um, I think it's so powerful and so poignant, April. Well, thank you. It's, um, I think, you know, when I was going through the titles, when you're going through this process, you're wondering, where are you in your life? You know, I just turned 39-ish 
going on 40. Um, no, <laughs> <laughs> I'm forever 27. So that's right. You, you come to this number, right? Um, and I think about some of the things that I've shared on stage because, you know, it was because of Re Freedom Riders that I be also became a, a speaker. And so I've traveled, I've been on so many stages, but there were parts of my story that I still had not embraced. And I felt like a fraud, you know, I felt like, man, um, that's just my personality. If you, you all know me, I'm pretty, who you see is who you get 24 seven. I don't change, I am who I am. Um, but it was like, man, what if I can fully, what if I finally fully embrace all the parts that I'm afraid to share? Because that is where the healing takes place, right? And that the darkness is where healing and all the things that we don't like to take care of or face, uh, that's really what the journey of embracing me has been about um, embracing this new life that we're living. It's it's not easy, but I feel like when we get to a place where we can say, okay, this is it. This is what we're going to have to do. Now we need to adapt and pivot, right? How do we just do this? You're not, you can't cry over spilled milk, but it was really just personal stories that I felt I've, I've been finally not ashamed of anymore. Um, and I've done the work, right? I've done so much work on myself, but sometimes you're just like, People can still be very harsh and judgmental. Um, and you just have to say, well, it is what it is. And this is my story. So that's really the birth of Embracing Me, a, a memoir. Someone was like, oh, but you're so young. And I was like, I, I know, but this is not an autobiography. This is, an, this is very personal for me. You know, I'm sharing things about my family. Um, you know, I share that my mother passed away. She, she passed away uh, 2017 and she died two months after I had my baby. So that whole transition of becoming a mother without your mother, like how, how do you do that? Um, I'm still learning, you know, I'm still finding moments where I'm like, man, I wish I just had a mom. We don't realize like, I mean, we know mothers are important, but when you become a parent, which, you know, Hunter will become a father soon, you realize, wow, like having, having good parents, <laughs> to guide you through that process um, is necessary. So I've had to embrace that as well. So really that's the genesis behind the book. Mm. Nice. Speaking of Hunter, I've been thinking about you a lot in the last week because one of the, the best scenes in the film is you're all watching the Freedom Writers on a, on a projector. And it's your voice over Hunter talking about the beauty of these freedom writers, um, African-Americans, Caucasians coming together to fight the segregated South. And that freedom writer role model is John Lewis. And so right. as he lays in wake at the, at the state capitol, um, as we honor someone who was a, a moral compass, um, who didn't just fight for voters' rights or simply civil rights. I think he fought for human rights. I love that it is your beautiful voice narrating that. So in losing John Lewis, did that take you back to filming and, and what our namesake was and you being a part of a film that now has this historical context? Um, <clears throat> yeah. I. I, you know, I mentioned uh, before, it, I think we were all pretty, pretty young um, when we, when we did the film, but I, I was also uh, just naive and there's been a lot of learning since then and a lot of listening and a lot of not listening um, as much as I, as I should have been. Um, and I think uh, John Lewis, it, his death is sort of the uh gosh the the um the continued story for what this year has been um for what it's brought uh for what it's brought notice to um and his, him leaving right now is sort of his last amazing way to uh to bring attention to the cause of his life um and i think uh, for me personally, I, you know, I, I really try try to avoid uh, 
association to someone else's story is is not something I get to stand on a platform and enjoy. Um, I'm guilty of it, and I and I'm grateful for that. But I'm humbled by it, um, and it only teaches me to uh, to be grateful for for what I do have and for what has transpired in my life personally, but in general, just in in life, and um, refocuses me, especially now, to continue to listen more than I've ever listened, um, continue to, to read and be conscious, continue, as you said at the beginning, um, or maybe you said it privately to us, but I just, I, this is so silly and cliche to say, but it, it really all does come back to love. Um, there is so much power in, in that simple act and, um, and I, I do believe that at the end of the day, that is the message of John Lewis. It is to, 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 to say, I, I deserve that as well. I deserve that, that love as well. And um, as do many people who don't get it the way that they should. And, uh, and I, think, I think that, I think this season of listening and coming back and slowing down um, has been personally awesome for me to be re reminded that that's the message. That's the message here. Mm, I love it. Deontay, one of the most amazing scenes um, was also the, the most organic in the sense that you guys went to the Museum of Tolerance, um, uh, an incredible museum that we've gone to year after year after year for over 20 years. Um, and your docents are these four Holocaust survivors, who people who've seen the movie may not know that they are actually Holocaust survivors, Eddie, Elizabeth, Gloria, and Renee. Tragically, we, we lost Eddie, but Renee just turned 96, uh, wow. Elizabeth is 94, and so is Gloria. And they are as beautiful now as they were when we met them. So can you talk about what that scene was like to be at the Museum of Tolerance and then to have dinner with and, and film this unscripted part where these Holocaust survivors were sitting amongst you, showing their tattoos, talking about Auschwitz without a script because it was their real story, their real lives. And I don't know um, if you had any special anecdotes of, of sitting beside one of those Holocaust survivors, but they are very much still part of our family and they love that you were able to showcase them. Uh, first, I think that that's awesome uh, that we were able to be so privileged to be in their presence. One, um, two, in one word, it was surreal. It was it was so surreal and such a surreal moment to go to the museum. I talk about this often, where I remember us. You know, those are the days that we were in our table reads and rehearsing and things like that, and we took the trip to um, the the museum of tolerance as a cast. Uh, I went as a kid, you know, in school, in elementary school, I think we went, but, you know, you're young, you're not paying that much attention. Uh, but to go back, uh, I just remember how it made all of us feel uh, to go through the process, because they send you on like a journey through Auschwitz and, and the different uh, types of oppression um, that, that, uh, that, you know, is, that is our history. Um, um, and I just remember feeling like, like going into it, it was all happy. Oh, yay, we're going on a field trip. Um, but I remember, I remember how quiet it was on the way back to the studio, uh, because I think it just hit everyone. Like it just hit home. It hit home to, you know, for us to really hear so much about, you know, slavery and 400 years of slavery to hear prior to, uh, this this concentration camp in Auschwitz, I think it's, uh, you know, I did watch the movie Schindler's List before going to the museum and just, it, it just takes the, it just takes your breath away to realize that these people survived this monstrosity, <laughs> like this, this unbelievable thing that you, that it just sounds like a movie. It sounds like, this is not real. Like you, you, you did not like, wait, you guys survived this mess. Like, and you're still here to share that story. Uh, I just thought it was simply amazing. It's so, so surreal. Uh, I had a lot of time with Miss Renee 
Firestone. <laughs> She's watching tonight. Renee oh, really? and Mother Claire are watching right now. <laughs> Hi, Renee. Uh, wow. Uh, well, I was sat at, uh, at the table with her, and then for her to show her tattoo, I just, you know, I, I wanted her to keep talking. Like, I just wanted to hear more about it because, again, like, I'm I'm very familiar with Shellis, and I'm very familiar with, with the Holocaust. Uh, but to hear the real voice uh, behind it and the, the the experience through her eyes and her ears and what she saw, what she felt, what she heard, uh, you know, that scene could have went on forever for me. Uh, but it was great. I, I think it's amazing that I love Richard for that, for implementing that uh, particular sector of the film and putting that in. I think it's very important. Uh, so many times people say, is that the real? I was like, oh, it's real. And I love to say that it's real. <laughs> it's such a proud moment to say that it's real. So, yeah, to me, overall, unbelievable. Unbelievable. Well, Deontay, when you come back to Los Angeles, um, I would be honored to take you to Renee and Claire Firestone's house for dinner. So, oh my God. That, that's a pinky square, which is a binding contract. And yeah. Hunter has been to, we, <laughs> we throw holiday parties every year. And Hunter's been at a holiday party where I think, um, Renee was teaching everybody the dreidel song. We were able to light candles for the menorah. So when you come back, um, Jackie, I'll, I'll, come as well. I'll be back soon. You know, my fam, my family's still there, so I'm, I'm always. <laughs> Jackie, I think another really important scene that was real. We did it in my classroom, and we still do it today with students and teachers. Is the line game, and yeah, when favorite. I. See your face in that scene. You you asked a question, you know, about does a refugee camp count? And what I have been able to do, unbeknownst to you, for the last um, twenty years, is every Christmas Eve, Frieda Myers and I go to a juvenile hall. My name, I'm going to get emotional, and we bring books and we pretend that we're Santa, um, but we actually have them watch the film before we come. And then we play the line game together. Wow. Um, and it is, it is devastating. And I'm crestfallen because I, I, can, I can be a little bit more direct with my questions. Um, you know, we did so recently and young girls had been trafficked. Um, young boys had been given drugs by their parents at the age of six. So when we play it now, the stakes are much higher. But can you talk about what it was like in that moment? Because it was exquisite for the audience to watch, the, the clenching of a jaw, the tightening of a fist, um, the anguish at first, and then the acknowledgement. So what was it like for you to be in the midst of that line game? Um, I mean, just personally, I felt I was blown away by the line game. That was my introduction to the line game, you know, and the whole, the amount of just being side by side with so many people in the most traumatic terms uh, was really just very eye opening for me. Um, you know, the message that we were sending with that scene was so powerful. Um, I think just like in, I think in playing the character, I just felt that there's a lot of like shame and embarrassment, <clears throat> you know, in admitting whatever your past experiences have been, you know, your traumas you don't want to talk about them. And that a lot of the times our traumas are what fuel us to kind of act out and be angry and be aggressive and, you know, just to do things that are actually more self-destructive. And so I think that, you know, with that, just the simplicity of that line for Cindy to just be like, does a refugee camp count? It's kind of like, I'm an outsider. Some American kids, a lot of American kids probably wouldn't even know what that means, refugee camp, you know? I mean, a lot of American kids don't even know about internment camps that the Japanese were, you know, had to live through in the 40s. So, um, oh, you guys are frozen. Hello? No, we see you. Perfect. Are we having technical difficulties? No, you're great. Okay, okay, cool. Um, okay, yeah, sorry, you guys were all frozen. I was like, is this... Am I still going? Okay, but yeah, uh, so I think that with with Cindy um, actually voicing the fact that she had been in a refugee camp, it's almost like she was saying like, I don't even know if I count. Like th this, this experience isn't really real for anyone here, but it's kind of defined my whole life. So 
will I, is it weird if I say, like, I, I kind of don't know, does it count? And, you know, now that I, it does, okay, I guess I do relate to everyone and everyone can kind of know about me. You know, it's, I thought that was so powerful and just that once in, in, with such a simple, like, line, it just said so much about this one person's, like, story. So, well, you know what it, what it actually did, Jackie, I, I believe, is it allowed my students um, to then start asking questions, which is leading to you, Giovanni. Your character enters my class, um, and we're going to have this toast for change. And this is not the scripted part of our story. You know, Freedom Writers picked up a, a plastic champagne glass and, and made a toast to dare to dream for something bigger and better. Um, and that's really scary when you put it out in the universe and, and you hope that the universe is listening. So when your character kind of walks into that moment, um, what you suddenly had is this crash, boom, bam moment of family is what we're gonna make and family is what we're gonna choose. So can you, can you talk about what that was like to be a witness while others were bearing their soul? It was, I want to say just a beautiful moment, you know, it, it allowed everyone to be vulnerable. It allowed everyone to just be present. And even though, you know, everyone was still reading their lines, it just felt so real and genuine. I think the entire film, everybody was extremely present and cognizant of what we were doing and what we were saying. Um, I completely accredit it to the casting and Richard because they paired us with such genuine stories that I think hit, hit us each individually, personally, in one way or another, that we could bring it to life. And I, I will never forget that moment. Um, when we shot that film, I had just came back from my aunt being murdered. So I had to leave set for a week to deal with some family. And that was the scene we came back to shooting. And it was, I wanna say right on time. It was just filled with love and genuineness. And, you know, the big hug at the end, I don't even think was really in the script. We just kind of did it, you know, it, it, everything about it just felt really natural. And it was, it was just it. <laughs> we love to use the word like accidentally on purpose in Freedom Rider World, that there's these moments of either serendipity or divinity. And I think when I look at all of your faces, it, it really was divine that you were chosen. Like you were chosen to be the embodiment of our family. So my last question for all of you, before we segue into the real Freedom Writers is, tonight is our celebration of a toast for change. Um, because what we're hopeful for is people who are watching could also then participate. You know, they could watch you get inspired and then do a toast themselves. And Gandhi said, may you be the change you wish to see in the world. So if each and every one of you could kind of think if you could do a toast, a toast now in 2020, in the midst of a pandemic and protest, what would that toast be now? And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go in reverse order. Um, I'm gonna start with you, Giovanni, and we will end with you, April. Um, <laughs> okay. And, uh, and I, I, wanna, I wanna go to what you and I had talked about. I know that you, you find yourself in Atlanta, which is, as our state in the midst of a, a spike in the coronavirus. And you found yourself as a mom now, we saw your husband walk in, you are this accidentally on purpose activist. And so in these trying times where people finally have voice and agency and advocacy, maybe your toast could be just that. Um, so maybe we'll start there, to be a woman in Atlanta in 2020, um, where people are finally saying, notice me, I, I have something to say. What is it that you wanna say? I, I would, I wanna be more bold with my decisions. 
more fearless with the direction I go in. Um, I definitely don't want to feel like I have to compromise just because I'm a mom or a black woman. Um, I want to make sure I have the wisdom to use my voice correctly. And with everything that has been going on, I'm appreciative of the opportunities, but I don't want to squander them. So that's why I keep saying I don't want to do it out of fear. Um, I just want to be as bold and badass as possible. <laughs> um, me likes, me likes. Jackie, you are a badass. So let's see. <laughs> and I love, I love your unapolog unapologetic grit. I love that even filming this movie, you had some personal things that were going on and I think that added to your character. So if you two could embrace Gandhi's being the change that you wish to see, what would that change be for you? I think for me, uh, I think a lot of time is spent on, you know, this whole, to be a badass, you know, it's, it's like this tough, tough guy thing. And I think um, for me, I, I really want to re remind myself and remind everyone around me that the, the toughest, baddest thing you can do is to listen and continue learning. And I mean, I, my toast for change would be to just like continue to at least doing one small thing consistently, whatever action that may be to help for self-care and for the community, you know? Mm -hmm. I think that sometimes like uh, in this day and age where it's a burnout mentality, I'm gonna do all this crazy stuff for this week, oh, it's all about me and myself and I'm gonna take care of me or I'm gonna just help the community for a little bit and kind of burn out and then what's the next thing? And I think for, I think uh, to be the change that we wanna see, we need to just continue taking like even small actions little by little consistently and remembering that we could be our, our baddest selves, like our toughest selves by, it's okay to cry and it's okay to let people cry on your shoulder and, and to just be empathetic and to love. So mm, I love that. That's what I'm all about right now. <laughs> We're trying. <laughs> um, Nancy, what I, I love about you in the film, there, there are moments where your smile, especially when you were dancing. I remember there's a, a scene where you're dancing um, with Mario, and then we see Hunter doing his robot, uh, which was fantastic. <laughs> but um, when, there, when there is joy, uh, your joy is the kind of joy that is contagious. Um, you, you light up a room, you light up a screen. So what would your change be with that joy? Man, wow, thank you. Um, with that joy, uh, my toast for change would be consistency um to be consistent in the practices that i was doing post freedom riders uh i do feel that freedom riders is was a life-changing thing for me uh realizing the importance of your voice everywhere i go every place i've spoken schools junior highs high schools colleges churches everywhere i've spoken and I even said in everyday life to friends at work, uh, but just to share your story, yeah. tell your story, um, because you never know how it may affect the next man or woman. Uh, you never know the inspiration um, and the impact it has on one's life just to simply uh, share your testimony, testimony in a sense. Um, I've speak, spoken at Juvenile, detention centers, um, jails here in Atlanta, um, via my professor in college, actually, like she, she, she coins me her favorite student, <laughs> but she's a, a chaplain at a, at a couple, uh, facilities out here in Atlanta. And so she calls on me, uh, every now and again to come and speak to these young men, uh, who've made mistakes, who, 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 you know, 
had to deal with the cards that they were that they were dealt. Uh, but everything I talk about with them is to not let their their life be shut down by a mistake. Not think that you're less than because you made a mistake. Um, yeah. The fact that you're still here, you're breathing, you're yeah. here, you still can make a difference in your life and the, in your next man's life. Uh, in your family, in your community. Uh, don't be consumed by your given circumstances. Uh, and don't be afraid to dream. Um, and to dream big, there's no limit. Uh, there's no cap on on your dream and what God can do for you. Uh, as long as you believe in yourself, uh, even if nobody else does, uh, don't let somebody's no stop you from being everything you want to be because you're probably going to hear more no's than yes in this world but it shouldn't stop you from being the great, the greatest, uh, your greatest self. Uh, so for me, it would be to stay consistent in, in, in sharing that sentiment. And even for myself to, re- to take the words that I'm saying and, 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 and regurgitate them uh, for myself um, in this life and in this journey, it's where we are today, which is why I thank April again for hitting me up a couple months ago. Uh, because it's something I thought about, but again, acting on it. And, you know, I feel like I could take something from what Giovanni said and what Jackie said, as far as being bold, as, as far as being fearless and, 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 and taking it into account with me. So my one word would be consistency though. Hmm. Honey, yours is omnipresent because your life is about to change. Um, I, I've been your friend through this journey. Um, we've gone to dinners, we've gone to plays, we we love spaghetti bolognese and we love uh, <laughs> sandwiches and tomato soup, but you're gonna have a baby in, in four weeks. So when you think about toasting for change now, it's with you and your beautiful wife. Um, it's this beautiful child that you're gonna bring into the world. So I want you to envision this toast being how you pay it forward to the life that you are bringing into this world and and what kind of world do you want your baby to be raised in? Uh, why do you always gotta do that, Miss G? <laughs> <laughs> you know. um, yeah, uh, that's so beautiful. It's such a beautiful invitation. It's a beautiful rite of passage as April, Deontay, Giovanni know. Um, and, uh, and uh, yeah, I'm absolutely scared. I think the things that I am, am thinking about and, and Jackie touched on this um, and we all like we are, it's a, such a sacred time for me personally because of this, but it's a sacred time in our world. It's a sacred time for all of us collectively. And I, I just heard like the word grace rise up. We, we just, you know, that's, I, I, we, we have to offer ourselves that um, patience, that grace, that, that uh, breath, um, that release, um, we're doing okay. You know, we're doing okay. And we need to, we need to, we need to love outward, but we need to love inward as well. Um, and the other thing is with that grace, you also have to be present. And I think I'm thinking a lot about being present right now um, and being, um, you know, we all in 2020 where there's a hundred things that that distract us and keep us thinking about you know and I know that'll be hard um you guys can attest to that I'm sure and uh, and slowing down and focusing in and offering concentrated love it doesn't have to be 24 7 all the time you know um I, I don't expect that but I, I want it to be concentrated um and 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 I think being present and fully in the moment uh helps helps to do that. And then the last thing I'll say, because I was fortunate enough to have some time uh, to think about this and get so inspired by what you guys mm-hmm. said, is honestly just um, uh, educate. Um, I think it's one thing to have a belief and it's awesome to hold on to it. And definitely, you know, um, it should be deeply rooted. It should be definitely held on to uh, with all your might. But education is also uh, an invitation. And this is a time for education, I think. Uh, I want my my daughter. She's a girl. I want her to <laughs> to not be afraid to to, to be educated. Um, and that doesn't mean a fancy college. It just means um, being curious and being interested in someone else's perspective. Aristotle has this great quote that says, "It's the mark of an educated mind 
to be able to consider somebody else's point of view and you don't have to accept it, but you can consider it and, and handle it evenly. And I love that. It rocked my world. And I just feel like we are in a place where that's fair. That's just fair, you know, like, but it, it does, you, you can offer yourself grace and be present and pursue education to understand everybody else around you at the same time. So those would be my sort of uh, focuses in this sort of season. Mm, love it. Yeah. So April, one of my favorite memories was being at your wedding with Maria, the character who plays you. And the love, like the outpouring of love. If you've not been to a Puerto Rican wedding, you don't know what you're missing. It was, it was larger than life. Um, so I honor that I got to know your mother and your father. And I hope you feel her presence. I know that you are a mother of two now. And your mother and my father are together looking down. And so for your toast, I, I'd love for you to weave in your mother because everything that you do now is, I'm gonna get emotional, but it's in her image. She was so strong. She was so stoic and so proud of you. She just glowed. And I know that's how you are with your daughters and that generation to come. So when you're toast, if, if you would do us the honor, would you incorporate your mom as well? My mother was a fighter. She was a <clears throat> she was a tough, complicated, um, beautifully stunning, complex human being, uh, <laughs> if I can put it like that. And um, as intense <laughs> and complex our relationship was, and even in her, you know, last days, what she did instill in me was the power of my voice all the time. You know, she would constantly, you know, plant that seed of reminding me the, that I could speak up, that I should speak up. Um, although when it came towards her, <laughs> She wasn't having it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> complexity in that. Um, but but it made me it made me realize, like you know, I always say, my dad taught me how to love, my mom taught me how to fight. Mm -hmm. And usually, it's like the opposite, right? We assume that our mom is nurturing, and she was the complete opposite of my father. You know, my father was nurturing and loving and empathetic and. My mom was just a straight shooter, um, but it was her ability to instill in me. And I think it's because she never really had it, right? She never had anyone empower her, ignite her, all these words and terms that we use. And so if I was to make a toast for change, especially in the climate that we're living in, it is really understanding the power of your voice, mm -hmm. understanding not most important, not more of what you say, but what you don't say. I think sometimes speak louder. And I think as actors, right, that's what we look for. What's not being said is where the juicy parts are. Um, right. And my mom, she fought to the end, you know, and, and, and I saw her fall and get back up. And then, you know, she just, it was her time. And so I think that that is what I teach my daughters. Um, to just know that they have a right to speak up, um, especially being women of color. Like we, we should always feel like we have a right no matter what. Um, and so that would be my toast for change. Hmm. Yeah. I wanna take that word fight and encourage all of you to keep fighting the good fight. Um, and if and when we fall, let's fall forward. Let's, let's catch each other. And I wanna, Thank each and every one of you personally 
for portraying those I hold dear. The, the Freedom Riders are my kids. They went from calling me Miss G to Mama G. And I'm so <laughs> happy that I get to be a mom to this incredible family. We call ourselves more colorful than a box of crayons. Um, <laughs> you honored us, you humbled us, and you are us. So I hope that you will stay tuned. Um, for those that are watching, um, please go back and, and rewatch this film and see them light up a screen. Um, have a conversation afterwards about these really big topics that are timely and, and still happening in our midst. And Giovanni, you talked about education as did Hunter. All of you kind of touched on things that are really our theme. Preparing for tonight, we reached out to teachers who literally serve the most vulnerable. And a lot of those kids are watching night. A lot of those kids are in foster care. A lot of those kids are incarcerated. And a lot of those kids look at a screen and, and want and wish and wonder when things will be better. And I hope that through your leadership um, that they can dare to dream like Beyonce said and, and, and dream big because your movie allowed a legacy and a legacy that is words and, and not weapons. So we're gonna segue in this part of our program to these teachers, teachers from every corner of the globe. Your dear friend, Hunter, um, Trezor Rusesa Begina from Rwanda um, is part of this montage. And we asked them to do what you just did, um, do a toast for those they humbly serve. Um, but they also did toast for themselves and those they love. And following that toast, you're gonna to meet some of the real Freedom Writers who have been watching and listening and crying because that's what we do in the Freedom Writer family. We watch, <laughs> we listen and we cry. Yeah. But I wanna thank you. This, this is really just the beginning. I feel like we're in our pajamas, having this con conversation in my living room. So I would love for this just to be the beginning of further conversations, but I thank you, I honor you, and in your, your mother's honor, we're gonna fight the good fight, April. So let's hear it for all of you, and let's watch these amazing teachers do just what you did, a toast for change. Hi there, everybody. I'm Nick Dara. My name is Tara Bordeaux. I'm Rochelle Wright. Nicole Lindemuth. Jess Sanchez. Bill Fever. Fan Schober. Kathy Conley. Renee Bender. Johnny Munoz. Deborah Fernandez. Beth Powell. Tyree Starling. Ken Williams. Crystal Russell. Tammy Farrington. Kathy Lindemuth. Tresor Vicessa Bagana here. Lisa Liss. Monica. Dr. Dustin Handy. Daniel from Denmark. Precious, coming from Florida. Reno Valley. Coming at you from sunny Eastern Kentucky. Beautiful Mohawk Valley of Central New York. French Cucamonga, California. Vista de Lago High School in Moreno Valley. Mansfield, Ohio. Navarro Early College High School in Austin, Texas. La Jolla today. Boston, Massachusetts. Sacramento, California. The Mix at Arbor Place. Sequoit uh, Middle School in New York. West Covina, California. Watkins Glen, New York. Murrieta, California. I'm the activities director, a high school math teacher. I am a fifth grade teacher. 11th grade English teacher, mental health therapist, and proud Freedom Writer teacher. I'm the director of the Viking Visual Cinematic Arts Media and Design Program. I am a first grade teacher, currently a kindergarten kindergarten teacher, but who knows what tomorrow will bring. I teach at the Fresno County Juvenile Justice Campus in California, Fresno, California. I teach at Pasadena City College. I am an elementary special education teacher. I teach amazing sixth graders. I teach English and arts and humanities at a high school called Knott County Central High School. I teach at a second chance continuation school through through eighth grade located in the high desert in Adelanto. Well, I'm just really inspired today because to be with all you Freedom Riders teachers who understand that we've got to love on our kids and and just make the best for them. It just makes me so happy because I feel like I'm with a family that's being the change that we want in the world. And I just make a toast. Toast for change. Toast for change. Toast for change. My toast for change is for teachers all over the world to be respected 
in every shape, form, and fashion because teachers are truly the hearts, the lighthouses, and the compasses of the world. My toast today is showing up as my very best self. That's all we can do. Be a little less hard on myself. My toast is for more love and acceptance. What I mean when I say love and acceptance, I mean love of yourself, uh, acceptance of yourself. Um, I don't think there's enough of it in the world. Uh, I sure didn't have enough of it at one point. So I want to see more of it. I toast to acceptance. To accept that it's okay to pause, slow down, breathe, to give back to the person that right now needs me most, and that's myself. It doesn't mean I give up or that I quit or that I stop putting the needs of my students first. It means that I'm recharging myself so that I can give them the very best me that they deserve. We're in this together. No matter how hard the struggle is, know that you matter, and you matter enough to show up for yourself as your best self. I need to believe in myself as much as I believe in my students and give myself a chance to make mistakes. The great Mr. Rogers once said that the person standing in front of you is the most important person in the world. Um, I've tried to live my life to the best of my ability in practicing that. Today, as I make this toast, it's fine and dandy to care a lot about others. That's a very important thing to do. But it, it's also very, very important that I take care of the, the person here. I'd like to extend to myself the same love and care that I try to practice for all others. So for all of the hardworking, dedicated, amazing teachers everywhere, who haven't given themselves a break, especially during this pandemic, this one is for you. In the hopes that you too will stop for a moment, take a break, breathe, and refill your well, because you deserve it. Right now, our students' lives have been turned upside down. They have lost a lot of the safety and security that they know. They've also lost their means of expression. Let your voice be heard, but also make sure you accept everybody else. And just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. Because if what you do stops another person's voice from being heard or hurts them in any way, then you should rethink about what you're doing. My toast for change is that we treat everyone like it's their birthday every day. Because on birthdays, we show each other kindness, compassion, and have nothing but the warmest of wishes for each other. And it's a chance for us to start a brand new day and a brand new year. So here's for a toast for change and happy birthday. My toast is for myself to become even more of an advocate than I already am for my students. To always getting to know all of my students and their stories by making meaningful connections with them, even in this challenging time. My toast is that God will allow me to press on in this area to reach as many kids as I can before my race is over. But even more so, my toast is for educators and people working with children alike, that when we come back in the fall, no matter what that looks like, we don't focus on what their test scores are or what they have missed, but we truly focus on their mental state. We focus on what they've been through and how they're feeling. We have gaps we need to fill, but they're not gonna be filled with hurting children and children that are scared. So my toast is to educators to love on those kids really hard give them reassurance and let them know that they're safe before anything else. My toast is to be a better listener to my students, not just to hear them, but to fully listen and appreciate and be able to place myself in their shoes. I want to be able to help advocate for them, empower them to stand up for what they believe in and how to do that uh, in a safe and effective way and give them a voice that they either haven't fully developed or don't realize that they have yet. For 35 years of my life, I spent silent, quiet, embarrassed. 15 years ago, I came out to my family and let them know that I was part of the LGBTQ community, that I was gay. And for the past 15 years, my life has been the most happiest, most loved, and most caring life that I've ever had. In this time of uncertainty, desperation, ambiguity, fear, and division, my toast for change is to continue to walk my journey. That we don't 
you know, go back to the world that was, that we go back to see people able to live their own truth and uh, tell their own story. I hope that what we see across the country and beyond is that we are more united by love than we are by hate. My toast is to never stay silent, to love who you love and help others who are struggling with the same situation I did. So here's to love is love and here's to being happy. This year on April 26th, I lost my very best friend, my dad. and. I am in true Freedom Writer fashion. I'm going to take that loss and I'm going to make myself stronger. And my hope is that because I am going to get through this somehow, I am going to be able to help my kids get through every anything. And I'm going to be a true model for those kids so that when my kids are hurting, they can be assured that they're going to get through it just like I'm going to get through this. My toast is that I vow to do everything I can to help kids at risk become kids at hope. My toast for change is to continue to listen, to learn, to respect every single student and person that I meet, and to hopefully take that knowledge of what I am learning and passing it on to all the kids and all the adults that I know. So my toast is to keep on changing lives because that's all I can do. To believing in your fellow man and allowing them to be honorable. We must change. I know we can do it. I know we can. And so here is to all Freedom Rudder teachers and all that we might encounter in this next decade. No matter how hard it may seem, there's always gonna be there somebody there to back you up and somebody there to push you a little bit harder, whether it be a spouse, uh, a kid, a student, uh, just keep on going and remember, persevere. That everyone throughout the world can experience equality and justice, regardless of their race, gender, and socioeconomic status. Um, The world is truly big enough for everyone to shine. Just wishing everyone to have love and peace because if we don't all come together um the world is not going to be a better place we need all of us we need love to make the world a better place for everyone and i challenge each and every one of you to do what michael jackson asked us all to do so many years ago start with the man in the mirror and ask him to make a change we live in a really conservative part of uh, california we don't really ever fly our flags we don't We don't go out in public holding hands. So with everything going on in the news, my son started to press us about, uh, why aren't we protesting? And, um, (laughs) you know, it's not safe, son. We don't don't know what we're gonna find. And one day he got so um, adamant that he wanted to protest that we found a safe, a safe protest to go to. And uh, he, he made his own sign. And we went out and we we protested with with friends. And, you know, he's feeling really proud of himself. And then he made another sign. And I said, son, this is not your issue. This is daddy and my issue. And he said, my dads are gay. It is my issue. And he's nine years old. And, uh, You know, the new generation. So trying to do more protest or whatever to for social justice, try fighting for social justice. And and so my dad can be less worried about everything. Oh. <laughs> and so my toast for change is to be more of my true self always for my students and for the public, the people around us. So that's my toast for change. Here's to you. Cheers. 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 Love you all. Love you all. Mwah.
Thanks. Cheers. 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 Thank you. Be well, everybody. So everybody stay safe and let's get through this together. Much love to everybody. Because this Tupac says, got to make some changes. Love you all. <sighs> no judging. I probably should have forewarned all of you that are watching that you probably need some Kleenex. Uh, there are moments both with the actors and these amazing teachers that make that lump in your throat or tug at your heartstrings. And so if you have it on your heart to help, um, help pay it forward, um, please do so. Um, every donation that we get tonight is gonna help the Freedom Riders pay it forward. And what these amazing Freedom Riders you're about to meet have been doing from the moment the pandemic happened is do just that, um, to pay it forward. Knowing that they're vulnerable kids who don't have access to a computer. Because of the love of our wonderful network, 17 kids were given computers in the last few months to do their homework, to have agency and independence and to be joined with our family. So all the fine folks you're about to meet have, have met those kids, have met their mentors who are doing talent and time to, to bring them up to speed. And so we're just so honored that part of this journey tonight is celebrating a story on the silver screen, celebrating the everyday soldiers that are serving in our classrooms, both in person and virtually around the world, and the original Freedom Riders who have agreed that family truly is what we make and what we choose, and we choose this, that. So in a moment, I'm gonna introduce you to this fabulous cast of characters that I have known since they were in high school. And if someone would have told me as an ordinary teacher that these extraordinary folks would be in my life for over two decades, I don't think I would have believed it. But they not only wrote the first book, The Freedom Writer's Diary, just recently we did the 20th anniversary. And every single face you're about to see is a part of that odyssey. Um, they wrote, they were editors, they were cheerleaders, and then they were able to pay it forward. And so that story continues and will continue even after tonight. So the Freedom Writers are gonna be launching off in a new journey. Um, we're gonna write another book. We're gonna call it Dear Freedom Writer. And we're so excited to celebrate other voices, voices of those teachers you just saw and some of the very kids who are watching tonight. Um, kids who need to be heard, kids who need to be seen, kids who need to matter. And so without further ado, I'd like to welcome all of these incredible Freedom Writers into your living rooms, onto your gadgets, on your computers. And what I'm gonna do one by one is introduce them. You'll see their beautiful face on the screen. And what I'm gonna do is tell you a little bit about what they have done in the midst of a pandemic to give voice an agency to kids who are at home, who are uncertain and insecure. And they're gonna continue doing that throughout the fall. We're gonna continue doing these amazing opportunities to come together and have live streams. For teachers out there, if you want to continue um, having us be the fabric of your classroom, we have just partnered with an amazing university, Waldorf University. So each and every live stream we do going forward, starting in September, you can get continuing education units, which is really exciting for all of us in the educational field to be able to continue to be lifelong learners. And that's exactly what the Freedom Riders are. So without further ado, for the next 30 minutes, for all of you that are watching at home, watching live, I would like to introduce my family one by one, and then I'm gonna dive a little deeper after I introduce them. First and foremost, there was a note. You saw Deonce, Jamal, and if you remember in the movie, he had that horrible caricature. Well, the actual artiste is not Picasso, but the actual artiste is Melvin Logan. He was the one that drew that note. So Melvin, if you could wave, blow kisses to our family and friends near and wide. Um, we're gonna learn a little bit more about your story and about 
um, how you've taken something from your past and it's become your passion and your purpose for today. So I'm thrilled that you're with us. There's also a moment in the film and that really tense scene um, where a young man raises his hand, asks the character Hilary Swank who plays me, what is that? What is the Holocaust? And that would be Carlos. Carlos was in that very room. Carlos giggled. Carlos knew what was happening and didn't care. And what I love about Carlos then who called me Miss G now calls me Mama G. So Carlos, can you wave and say hello to everyone near and far? I got a little weepy talking to Jackie. Um, she was this beautiful composite of, of two students. Um, she was a composite of Kanya and Bunny, two really bold and brave young women from my class. So I might cry a little more tonight with Kanya because she's always been our lotus flower. She's always been this beautiful soul. Even in times of, of tragedy, she teaches us how to have triumph. So hi, Kanya. Hi. Moving uh, down the row, what I'm not supposed to do as an English teacher is, is to give away the ending of a book, but I'm gonna do that right now. The 20th anniversary edition, uh, we wanted to, to end our book on a high. A celebration. You know, sometimes when you think that the good guy doesn't make it, what happens when they do? So the Freedomers got to vote on the order of those new stories, and it was unanimous that the very last story in the 20th anniversary had to be about triumph. It had to be aspirational. It had to be able to dare to dream and dream big. And that was Norma's story. Norma is going to be a doctor. So what a fabulous way to end a story that started in a classroom that you can be a lifelong learner. And so for our soon to be Dr. Bravo, uh, Norma, can you say hello to everyone near and far? Hello. Um, beside Norma, uh, the figure that I think of when I think of empowerment um, is Shanita. Uh, traditionally, besides Shanita is her twin sister, Shanette. And after 25 years, you would think that I could tell them apart. I still can't. They are identical twins. They change their earrings on me. They switch shoes. So tonight, I only have to contend with one of my beautiful twins. But whenever I need a shoulder to stand on, uh, a shoulder of a giant, it is Shanita. Shanita is embracing the theme of empowerment. And what I love about Shanita is when I needed a foot soldier to go to the Middle East, one of the first people I asked was Shanita. And she said yes. And she was on that plane. She found herself on foreign soil. And in a world where there are walls, she builds bridges. And so say hello, queen of empowerment, Shanita. Hi, guys. Also on that trip, um, besides Shanita was Narada. And in the theme of the movie, many of you probably have found yourselves at different parts of the feature film feeling a little emotional. Um, there's a moment, a young boy stands before uh, all of us after the toast for change. And that's our theme for night, toasting for change. This boy stands in front, he's got a marble journal and he reads about being homeless that very journal word for word was Narada's story. That story was written years ago in a classroom. That story is forever number 24 in our book. And so Narada, I'd like you to say hello to everyone who has to thank you for crying in the feature film in that very tender scene. Can you say hello to all of our friends and family near and far? Hello, everybody. I was crying with you, so. Oh, <laughs> and we may continue to cry a little bit more. Last and certainly not least, um, I have been thinking about this beautiful spirit every moment of every day as of late. Um, we keep paying homage to Congressman John Lewis, that boy from Troy who walked across that bridge in Selma. He's our namesake. And in the 20th anniversary 
one of the most exquisite stories was written by the next freedom writer. Her family is from Selma. Her grandfather was a sharecropper. Her father hands picked cotton himself as just a young boy. And so as we watched that processional over, over that bridge last week, um, I thought about Latia because Latia wrote about John Lewis, about our namesake, about standing up, speaking up and speaking out. And that is what she does every single day. She did it then in our classroom and she, she certainly does it now. So Latia, can you say hello to our family near and afar? Hello everybody. <laughs> You light up the screen. So I'm going to start with you, Latia, because your face is now on my screen, oh, um, larger than life. And so what I'd love to do first and foremost is when the pandemic hit, I, I set out this cry for help. And luckily it didn't fall on deaf ears, but I said, kids are hurting. And I knew that you understood that because you are a mentor, you have your masters and you are a masterful mom. And I asked you to come and to speak to kids about gratitude, because I think that's really the essence of the 20th anniversary edition. And so what I'd love for you to do is to tell all the teachers and friends and students that are watching how gratitude is woven into the very fabric of your story from room 203 to the 20th anniversary to the passing of a civil rights icon and beyond. Well, I definitely feel like gratitude is just the, the thankfulness that you have for others. And in 203, I felt as though we were always sharing the stories from the past and being able to learn from those people who were stakeholders within our community and within our history um, to then, you know, lead us to what foundation that we would create as freedom writers, like having that tool as writing, learning to read and kind of really getting involved with the characters. And then if there were non-fictional stories, bringing these people to life and bringing them to us so that we can see that we can make a change too. And as um, I was writing my story um, in our 20th anniversary, I wanted to pay homage to um, Mr. You know, um, John Lewis, because he was such a person who, you know, paved the way for civil rights movement, you know, and to learn so much history coming from my father and his story about his experience as being a sharecropper son. That's the same story that matched and paralleled um, with John Lewis. His father was a sharecropper too. He did a lot of things. He had to make a choice. Um, whether or not he was going to go to college or would he be a sharecropper son still working and toiling on those fields, trying to make a living for his family. But his father and his family, you know, believed in him for him to go on and, you know, fight within um, the <clears throat> civil rights movement with Martin Luther King. And what I love about his story was that he did choose education, which became the story for myself and how we need champions. And I believe Martin Luther King was a champion in his life, a, a mentor. And that's what I focus on right now. Just having those, being thankful for everyone that comes um, before you, whether it be good or a bad experience, I feel like there's still an experience there. And what I love about um, John Lewis, how he spoke about, even though he was beat by those officers, you know, it, it came full circle for him. You know, they came back and said, I apologize. You know, that man who beat him and, you know, cracked his skull and, you know, had him in the hospital came back to apologize. And he said, I can forgive. And so just being thankful for forgiveness, thankful for the experience, whether it be good, like I said, or bad. I, I know that um, we all are here to set ground. And my purpose is to change people's life through mentorship. I think that's what why we all stand, stand here today or sit here today virally with you, Erin, because you changed our life through mentorship. Even though we didn't know that word as prevalent as it is now, it definitely casted us in a, and pivoted us in a way we can be more open to other opportunities. And so I'm just grateful for the fact that you are in my life and all my fellow freedom writers, because we learned so 
much from one another. And I know that we're changing education because now that's gonna be the focus, social emotional learning, how we represent, how do we feel about education? How do we feel about ourselves? And I think that's the courage we need to, in order to be our best selves is just knowing who we are, standing in that and being thankful. Mm. What I, what I love what you said about mentors is exactly what you as Freedom Runners are doing now with these amazing kids that we partner with and they're paying it forward. So Freedom Runners are working with high school students. High school students are working with middle school students. And eventually these middle school students are going to be working with elementary school students. So it's really this incredible cycle of, of, of joining forces, uh, joining forces and voices together. I also love that when you... Uh, we're watching the processional over the Edmund Pettus Bridge and your family in Selma, their prayer is that they will rename that bridge. So what was that like to be on the phone with aunties and, and family members who had experienced what happened in the past, but also got to experience the hope for the future for that bridge to have another name? I also, my family you know when you look at Selma they see it as what it looked like in 1965 there's not that much change and I think for a place where that was the you know the breaking grounds of the civil rights movement altogether you would think that some things would have changed or you know become upkeep or just because it's so monumental in Selma uh, I think the matter of everyone's perspective of how John Lewis would do his last um, you know, I guess, you know, grace of presence over that bridge will be something like, okay, next time we see this bridge or, you know, the next time your family members see this bridge, it can be named after you because it's because of you that those are the reasons why all the things that we can, we stand on today, you know, a lot of things have not changed, but we can stand on what our experience have been in the past. And I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, that bridge being a place where we can stand homage to um, John Lewis. It, it was a beautiful scene. I love how they stopped in the middle of it and did the aerial view of it. And I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful. Like I said, my, I'm team gratitude. I'm so thankful that we got a chance to meet this man and he was our namesake. This is what we decided we wanted to be. We wanted to be changed through our writing. And he was a change through being a writer through the um, South during that time. So I, I, our family is looking to see more than just the um, aesthetics change, but you know, real, facting, real factors that will allow us to move forward and be together and be as one, you know, a human race. Mm, I love that. Well, we wouldn't be family if it wasn't for this crash, boom, bam moment. Um, I'm standing in the front of my class. I'm, I'm nervous and insecure with my polka dots and pearls. And Melvin, yes, you, Melvin. <laughs> so get a marker. You took out a piece of lined paper from your notebook and you drew a caricature, a horrible caricature. And off it went like a blaze, um, like a forest fire. And that note that action changed everything. Um, when the pandemic hit, you became the face of kindness, which was the doppelganger of, of what you are now. But when you were in my class, um, some would say you were the bully. And what I love about you is you took accountability, um, you were transparent and you apologized. So I'd like you to talk about what kindness means in the face of those bullies, whether they're on a playground, whether they're in a classroom, whether they're at a pulpit, um, whether they're a president. Talk about how important it is for us to be kind during this trying time now and how you, you taught all of us that it's never too late to change. Well, first off, um... I remember back um, drawing that picture and I, the laughter and, and the attention that I got. But one thing I never stopped to think about is what it actually did to Sherrod, um, how it hurt him, um, what kind of emotional trauma it could have caused for him um, in front of the class, making him feel the way he did. 
And uh, Sherrod and I are really good friends. Um, we've become good friends over the years. Um, and so when I, when I wrote in the 20th anniversary, um, I really wanted to take some time to acknowledge that and apologize for something that um, really shouldn't have never been done. Um, like you said, some would call me the bully. Um, but the reason that I wanted to toast for change for kindness is because I think kindness will trump everything that's going on in the world right now. Um, you know, if I would have taken a second um, to really think about what I was getting ready to do at that time, I don't know if I really would have done it, you know, um, especially the, the man that I've, that I've grown into. Um, I also wrote in a book about my son um, in that same situation and what my wife and I would have done and how we would have felt if someone had ostracized him the way I did. So the reason that I, that I chose kindness is because I think in everyday situations, um, if you really step back a second and think about what you're getting ready to do or what you're getting ready to say, um, and you do it with a kind heart, I think that alone can cause a ripple effect throughout the world. Um, what you're getting ready to say, how you're getting ready to do it, um, and do it with kindness. Um, maybe there wouldn't be so much police brutality, maybe so many people may not have lost their lives to senseless violence if they would just stop for a second and approach the situation with kindness. Um, and that's something that I really strive to do. And, you know, a lot of people, it, a lot of people don't realize the courage it takes to do the right thing. Um, and that's, that's courage that I've built up over the years being a freedom writer. That's the type of courage and courageousness that, that you get being a freedom writer. Um, and that's for all the freedom writers. It takes a lot of courage to, to stand up, do the right thing and act in kindness, regardless of what someone says to you, uh, of how someone treats you. You know, if, if you act in kindness, I think a lot of the problems can be resolved and, and a lot of things would be different in the world. So um, kindness um, goes a long way for me. Um, yeah. Especially when you put yourself in real, real life, world situations, like I couldn't imagine um, what I would do if someone had done what I had done to Sherrod, to my son, while he was sitting in a high school class. So um, as a freedom writer, as a father, as a husband, as a friend, um, I really think uh, kindness can, can make a difference for everyone. Mm, thank you for that. Carlos, you were in that class um, and I said this big word that you had never heard of and had, had not studied in, in high school yet. And in those years since, um, every single birthday, um, you were there to give Renee Firestone a hug, an, an Auschwitz survivor. Um, when the pandemic is over, we're going to give her that birthday hug. She just turned 96 and is watching tonight. But you also got to go to the Middle East and to be both in Israel and the Palestinian territories to really learn firsthand about man's inhumanity. So can you take us back, Carlos, to those days in that classroom with me, that, that moment where Melvin drew that note, it took off like a blaze and everything that hit you to learn about acceptance. Okay, um, when, uh, when that happened, uh, I was deeply into tagging and tag banging. Uh, I would just hang around with nothing but tagger friends that are nothing but Mexi uh, all Mexican. Gangs also were Mexican. Uh, at the time, uh, Mexican would just get along with nothing but the Mexicans. They wouldn't get along with any other any, any other crew, which, which it, it could have been Asian, Black, Samoan, Filipino, whatever race it was. Um, so when you when Melvin drew that picture of Sherrod, uh, we were, we were laughing about it, you know, because we didn't know any better. Uh, we, we thought it was funny because uh, uh, finally, we, 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 you know, we had talked about that. Finally, somebody got Sherrod, you know, for, you know, for the way Sherrod will behave. But, but when you picked up the, the, the note and you started lecturing us about it, 
and you got you know you, you caught my attention and when you mention the holocaust that that word right there just i i like i like i froze and i was like like i just i wasn't even listening to you what what you were talking about i was just focusing on that word holocaust and by me not by me raising my hand it was kind of a i mean i had a i had a put my pride to the side a little bit and raise my hand i wouldn't raise my hand just for the fact that in, in other classes, if I will raise my hand more two, two to three times, I will get this gestures from the teachers. So that will make me feel really uncomfortable. So I, I wouldn't want to raise my hand all the time. So, but with you, I did raise my hand and I'm glad I did raise my hand because that was a very powerful uh, word that you said that I didn't know what it was. Uh, when you explained to me what it was, I started thinking about me being uh having no parents in my life at that age. Uh, and I thought I had it pretty rough, but once I learned what you were talking to us about the Holocaust, about what they were going through, uh, it made me realize that, you know what, man, we only live once. I'm like, you know what? So by you teaching me this and you guiding me through it, I put my, let's tell you, I put my ignorance to the side and I decided to say, you know what? Uh, if my friends are going to try to tell me not to talk to other different races for whatever reason, I started getting to the point I'm like, man, wait a minute, this is stupid. This doesn't make any sense to me, you know? Uh, so I decided to make my own choices after listening to you, after the guidance that you were giving me. Uh, and I decided to continue talking to other races. And now I have different types of friends, you know, and my job today is, to teach these young kids these days to try to respect everyone with respect. We only live once. Uh, you know, we're here one day, tomorrow we'll be gone. You know, like Melvin said, kindness, you got to be kind to everyone. You never know when you're going to be gone. So you always got to be prepared for everything, you know? And um, so that word changed me. The freedom, the, uh, becoming the freedom writer in this organization completely changed me around. Uh, I thank you for doing that to me. Uh, if it wasn't because of you, I don't think I would ever uh, think different with different races. And now I teach my kids, my girls to do the same thing. You accept everyone 100 percent, you know, into your life, whatever it is. It doesn't matter what color they are. Um, you, you treat them with respect. Mm. One, of the, one of the things I get to brag about as your mom is the Freedom Riders every summer give college scholarships. And before it was to folks that were first generation to go to college. And last year, both Carlos's daughters and our, our next fabulous freedom writer, Shanita, um, her son were able to get a, a college scholarship. And I'm here to tell the world today that Carlos's daughter got straight A's her first year of college. And I just think that really is a tribute to you, Carlos. And she's, a four, and, she, and she's a 4 point student. Yeah. She's a 4.0. So when I think about that amazing scholarship banquet we had last year, um, you were crying, I was crying, Shanita was crying, Norma was there, she was crying. Uh, Shanita, let's talk about um, what, what Carlos and Melvin and Latia mentioned was this idea of, of mentoring and being a champion. And what you have done so incredibly is you travel with me everywhere and you meet kids where they're at, whether or not they are in foster care, you love on them just the same, whether they are behind bars, you love on them a little more, whether they are behind a wall, you are the ultimate freedom writer teacher. And so a lot of those amazing mentees, recipients of love and technology. A lot of those kids are watching tonight because we were able to get them a computer. Um, it makes me so emotional thinking about how proud they must be if we do a shout out to Jeremiah, to Joseph, to Robert, to, to all these beautiful kids. So knowing that you got to meet all of these kids who just needed to be seen and to feel special to feel chosen and wanted. What does that mean to you? Um, because you are team empowerment. You empower others. So what is that like knowing that all of these beautiful kids are watching tonight in real time and 
because of the efforts of your story, um, we were able to lift and to rise, not to give handouts, but to give hand ups. It actually makes me feel very good. And I don't know, I just feel really giddy when you think about things like that, because it makes you feel good and tingly inside. So that really tells you that you're doing the right thing, regardless of what it is. A lot of people do things because of what they look like doing it, you know, on the outside or what accolade they would get or what award, what somebody would talk about them saying, you know, and that's not what it's about. What it's about is really doing it because it needs to be done. And that's what you have to do when you meet the child where they are, regardless of where they are, you have to see them for them. And that's the only time you're able to see them clearly is by getting down and dirty with them, going to their level, whether it's high, whether it's in the middle, whether it's low, you have to just get where they are. Because just because of where they are by their environment doesn't mean that they need less than. Doesn't mean that the person is any less of a person than you are, or you know, doesn't need love, or doesn't, they might need a little bit extra love because of the simple fact of the trials and tribulations that they have to go through. The road that you were paved will be totally different from theirs, but when you actually have a conversation with them, you do like, well, I did this, I did that, but we still ended up in the same thing. So you'll find out that you have actually more in common than you actually have different. So when you empower people to do things, you actually give them the authority to control their environment, to make a difference in their lives. And a lot of the kids that we deal with don't have that authority because people think that, oh, you're a child and you don't know or you haven't been through or you don't, you don't qualify enough. And who are we to say that they don't qualify? The things that these kids have been through, they're overqualified. And so that's why I'm very proud when I get to get a chance to work with, you know, kids and, you know, near, far and wide, because it doesn't matter where you are, having an opportunity is having an opportunity. And that's the bit, that's the bottom line. And so our goal is to literally encourage these kids to be able to go further and further their dreams and make a difference and a change that they want to see. Because in the future, it's all about them they'll be the ones taking care of us. So unless we pave the correct path that they need to be on, what do we have in the end to look forward to? We really won't have too much if we're not raising these kids with the, the, the foundation that they need to be able to stand on. If their foundation is cracked, they won't be able to stand. And that, that really looks to us as far as what we did to help them. If we were not there to help them, then they're losing the end. I love that. Um, because of you and your, your family members, 17 kids in, in just a few months have got brand new computers. That's amazing. Some of them were even better than the computers we have at the Freedom Arts Foundation. And Sue Ellen was like, I want one. I'm like, nope, they're going to the kids. Um, what I want to do is move to Kanye. Because when we started our curriculum, we were, it was like making spaghetti. We would boil the water, we'd throw it on the wall. What would stick? And Kanye came into the office like two or three weeks into the midst of the pandemic. And what we did not realize then is that our curriculum that we put out in the world for free would be downloaded in 60 countries, literally 60 countries. People are, are using all of your faces. Um, Shanita being empowerment, Melvin being kindness, Carlos being acceptance. Well, Kanye was also acceptance. And what I'd like to do with you, Kanye, is when you came in, it was really trying. Um, we, were, we were the first state to be um, forced to stay home. And your mother is a genocide survivor of Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. And on that very day that you came in, it was so close to home. I know the character in the feature film uh, plays you, but when you came in that very day, it wasn't about Kanye. It was about your mom paying tribute, paying homage about what your mom had gone through and the mental health triggers that she was now going through in the midst of both a pandemic and then shortly thereafter, uh, the protest. So in homage of what you've learned um, about your mother, about being a mother to a beautiful son, can you, can you tell our audience what it was like to make curriculum that would speak to kids, no matter what city, state, country, or continent, that you just wanted to speak to kids about how important it was to be accepting? 
all of my life, I struggled to quite accept this. And it was this great country of America that accepted us, um, you know, as refugees from a war-torn country. And um, I was that kid that I was never picked. I didn't have friends. And I would often wish that uh, I had more friends uh, because I wasn't accepting of myself and I didn't understand. But it wasn't until in your class that you were acceptance of me. This I wasn't that kid that had the best grades. I actually failed miserably in school because I didn't care about school. Um, I didn't care about graduating. Like, I feel like life to me didn't really matter. Like I was just, it like it was like I had no hope. But meeting you and um, you were so accepting of me for the first time in my life, like without judging me by my grades, without judging me by my past or how I look, you just taught and you taught from your heart and you poured your heart and effort. And then I'm so grateful for the Freedom Writer family and how we have grown because I've gained acceptance in a family that I can, that is for life, for a lifetime, and have grown to um, expand and play it forward to every life we have touched so far through the impact of this movement and through the impact of personally my life and paying homage to my mother and my family, um, you know, for for giving me a voice, for giving me um, this voice to speak on behalf of them, who um, they might not be able to articulate, but so I'm that voice of hope. So next time you pass judgment on somebody or, you know, we go on about our day all the time and we judge people. I'm, I know I'm guilty of it. So um, for me, it's like the next time we judge somebody um, that we open up our hearts and we really look at that person and empathize with them like, what if you were in their shoes? How would you feel? I'm sure that person who's ever, who's walking that path is doing absolutely the best that they can with the resources that is thrown to them. So the best thing that we can do is open up our heart, you know, and really it, it, it's the, you don't know the impact of a smile, the small gesture, how much it can lighten up somebody's world and make, somebody feel value when they might feel like you know nothing matters so I really want to thank um, you for being my second mother and you know the Peter Ryder family and just really showing me what it means to have unconditional love. Oh. I, we have two more Freedom Riders, so I want to ask all of our listeners, and in Freedom Rider world, time is kind of an ish. So if you could stay with us for a few more minutes, um, we have two last Freedom Riders to, to share their story. Um, I want to go to my sweet Norma, um, who's going to be a doctor, who's going to help patch and fix and repair because I think the world right now in the middle of a pandemic needs to get patched and fixed and repaired. Um, so not only is she gonna do it with her white coat and her stethoscope, but she does it every single day. So she was our team perseverance. So Norma, could you talk about how you fix, how you make things better? And it's not just because you have access to a Band-Aid, but it comes from your heart when you help repair the world. Well, um, fixing um, doesn't just happen in, you know, with a Band-Aid or medically. Um, fix, uh, fixing comes from, from inside. And I think that's the most important kind of fixing that we can do. And I think a lot of us started to fix ourselves, quote unquote, you know, in, in the healing process. Uh, when we wrote our stories, when we learned that our story mattered, that there might be people out there just like us who could also be fixed, you know, by hearing um, that they are not alone, that they are, there are other people like them in the world. And just knowing that everyone's path is unique, but everyone's path is important. 
And so healing from within is, is what we need to start. And I think we, we learned that, you know, 20 years ago in, in your class and we continue to learn it as, as we get older. Now we have our own kids and we know the importance of, of being healed, you know, and it, it, amidst, you know, this pandemic, I think it, it's important to see that we're not just trying to fix a virus. We're not just trying to fix symptoms of, of the virus, but I mean, we have found a way to connect in different ways as we are right now. And so we continue to, to fix and to, to learn and to heal from, from within, even during these trying times. Mm. And for those of you at home, imagine taking your MCATs during a pandemic, what, which Norma had to do, but she did it. And I honor her that. Unbelievable. Uh, last but never least in our Freedom Rider family, um, our vision tonight was a toast for change. And Narada was that story. Um, the toasts were made, he stepped forward and, and read his journal. It was powerful. And what he wrote in those last few sentences was, I have hope and I am home. So Narada, in honor of everyone that's watching in their homes, whether they're in Israel, whether they are in Nepal, where our friend Siddhartha is, whether they are in Brazil, where our friend Labisco is, or Rwanda, or any of the countries that we've been able to call our friends and family. Um, you taught us that there is hope and there is a home. And that's why we had you be our team resilience. So can you tell everybody, no matter where they are, the importance of hope and the importance of home? Importance of, of hope and home if you look at any anything in this world or anything that's important, these are key elements of making or keeping things together. Uh, uh, to have that, you know, you need that. It's essential to to um, making things better, making things right. Uh, and for to me to be fourteen and going through what I went through and all that, and to come out of that and I had to find a home within 203. Um, I found a second mother within you. Um, I found other brothers and sisters with the people and the faces that you see and that you don't see on this screen tonight. Um, I had to do that for me. And I was thankful and I was blessed because of, of you and because of them. Because if I didn't have that, I didn't know what I had at the time. If you lose everything, you lose the bed and that you're used to laying your head down or there's no refrigerator for you to go into and get food and, and all these things. That's like your base, it's your base. And to be young and helpless in it, what do you have? You know, at that time I didn't have anything at all. You know, who cares about school? Who cares about doing anything? Your whole focus is on what you lost and to watch a, a sheriff lock the door on what I had or what I thought I had of all I had and to have my possessions in the street um, picked up for trash the next day because I couldn't take them to wherever it was going, you know, and then to come to school and to try to focus, it was like, forget it. So um, to have hope and, and to have a home was 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 important. It was key. If I didn't have those things, no telling which road I would have took. I surely probably wouldn't be here um, talking to different countries and stuff about what happened, or even had the um, the opportunity to pick up a pencil or a pen or a typewriter and write down what was going on, uh, which was one of the hardest things to do because it's sheer embarrassment when you go through something like that and you have a group of people or a classroom or neighbors or family or friends or whatever, everybody wants to keep a good face. Everybody wants to be whole. Everybody wants to be normal, but to have a situation to where you know darn well it's not normal, um, it, it messes with you. It's like you're holding in depression and it's you can't, there's no way that you can let it out because you feel like 
then everybody, you're not, everybody's not going through what you're going through, but you don't know that. So um, it causes depression and stuff. So, but um, the importance of having, of having hope and the importance of having a support system is so key. It's, and I'm just talking in my situation, but think about other people in their situations that probably had it worse. Uh, countries where things are probably worse, uh, families where things are probably worse. You know, um, to come out of anything bad and to be able to find any type of light to guide you out of that darkness so you don't continue to stay there is a blessing within itself. And I had 149 blessings, well, 150, because that includes you, Ms. G. Um, but, you know, I had to have some type of resilience within me in order to go to that light and stay in, and not stay in that dark. Um, I think for anybody that's going through anything, they got to have that resilience also not to have have that resilience and have that hope. You know, if you have that glimmer of light, go towards that glimmer of light. That's what you do so that you can change your surroundings. Even if you got to leave everything that's around you in order so that you can get to where you're going, where your future is going and all that, you know, it's necessary. It's so necessary. They, they, um, we show this scene in the movie of the line game, uh, people stepping into the line and, and things like that. I also, I often talk about how that line game isn't just a game. It wasn't a game for me um, to step to that line and, and to let your burdens down, you know, that with that blue tape across that floor, that was the light. Uh, a lot of times for a lot of us because we would hold things on and we would all have to save face whatever was going on at home uh we'd all hide it in but the minute that bell rung we got right back to whatever was troubling us you know um but that was one of the ways that there was light presented for us to have hope and you provided that for us i always talk about how you're the coach you changed the atmosphere in the classroom and you did that for us had you not change that classroom hat and actually let's break it down had melvin not been a knucklehead and wrote that note mm. and carlos not raised his hand and asked what the holocaust was you know none of this happens and that goes to show you that you can take a bad situation and there's still some type of beautiful thing to come out of it mm. you know um if I could go back in time, I'd kiss Melvin on the forehead and say, thank you for making that note. Because look at all the beautiful that came from that picture. If Carlos didn't inquire about what was the Holocaust, look what came because Carlos was was curious about what's going on. You know, um, that goes to show like in life, you just, you just don't know. You have to keep that hope because you don't know what you're going to create, what good is going to come out of everything. So you got to have that hope. You got to find that light. You got to have that resilience to keep going and, and push forward whatever's going on so that you can um, see the other side and, and, you know, you'll bring other people with you because they'll get to see the bad or they'll, they don't think that there's a way out of their darkness, but you've been through it. And so now you can go back and tell them. And that's what we kind of been doing for the past 20 years. And uh, man, the, the results have been beautiful and they'll continue to be beautiful. Wow. So for all of us that are, are gathered tonight, um, thank you for giving us your time and your heart to, to heal and have hope and to be the light. And I heard once from a Holocaust survivor, there is the light and the mirror that reflects it. Um, tonight we saw the light, be it those amazing young actors who portrayed my students, whether it was those courageous teachers in their classrooms or the Freedom Riders themselves. But now we get to be that reflection and my hope for each and every one of you, no matter where you are, pay it forward. Help us help others. If you wanna help us get more computers to a kid, please do so. We've got the time, we've got the talent, we've got more kids to help than we can count. Um, if you wanna pick up a pen and write yourself, um, it's liberating and cathartic and it will change. Or if you simply wanna have a toast with those that you hold dear, pick up a glass and toast to change. Each and every Freedom Writer that participated made a video and you can go to our website and you can scroll, see their faces, see their toast um, and toast beside them. 
So if you have it on your heart to be part of our family, our family just keeps getting bigger and deeper and wider. We invite you all and we thank you all for being a part of our high school reunion, our Toast for Change. Thank you for spending over two hours with us on, on a Wednesday night. There's still so much to do but we can't do it without you. So we thank you, we honor you. I'm gonna ask every Freedom Rider to raise a glass and we will say cheers. Cheers to each and every one of you to what you can do, what you must do, and what we will do together. Cheers. <laughs>